So just a few days ago, Nathan Robinson over at Current Affairs wrote a piece entitled, Isn't Right-Wing Populism Just Fascism? And it was a piece meant to target the Hill TV's rising with Crystal Ball and Sagar and Jetty, basically saying that Crystal Ball is enabling Sagar and Jetty's right-wing takes, which basically lead into fascism. Now, this exploded all over social media. It exploded over the internet, over lefty circles, everywhere with an accusation like that. And so I've got Chris with me here. We're going to break it down and talk a little bit about it. So Chris, I want to first get your take, get your opinion. Is rising a pipeline to the alt-right? Yeah, I definitely don't see it that way. I mean, I think a show where you have an exchange of ideas by two people who genuinely seem to believe those ideas, I think is a great, a great platform, right? We see many platforms where people put out their ideas and you just don't really think they actually stand behind those ideas. They're just saying it because they're making a lot of money to say it. It seems to me like when I watch Rising, I think those two people actually truly believe in their ideas. And I think it's great to get those ideas out there and have have this, you know, you can hear other people's ideas. How strong can you really have of a yeah. conviction if you don't really understand other people's opposing point of views? And I think it's helpful to hear those point of views and maybe they'll change your mind a little bit or maybe you then can think about their point of view and then you have more evidence to discard that person's idea and say, no, that doesn't work for me. But at least you've done that exercise then. You've kind of done your due diligence rather than just hiding in a dark room and thinking that your ideas are perfect you know, you got to test them against stuff and, and see if they they hold up. Yeah. So I would say my view is actually very much so like I, I'm pretty in favor of the idea of, you know, you got to argue with people you disagree with. I, I grew up in a conservative household. I've studied Christian liberal arts literally my entire life. I've, uh, you know, I've studied that. And so my entire life has been, uh, <laughs> you know, like arguing with people that I, you know, that I don't agree with. Um, that said, I want to make sure that I'm giving Nathan Robinson a fair, you know, a fair shake of his position, because his position is basically an argument that, hey, look, you know, we can't make a clear delineation of where you do and do not agree with someone, right? Because the claim, for instance, uh, Kyle Kalinske made a video about it, and he basically said, well, look, where I agree with you, then we work with you, and where I disagree with you, then we don't work with you, right? That's sort of Kyle's claim, and that's the general claim that a lot of people are making, and to be honest, that is my position, right? But I think Nathan Robinson would respond by saying something along the lines of, well, you can't really make that delinea delineation like that. So for instance, in the case of Hitler, which he specifically brings up and brings up Mussolini when it comes to, you know, basically Sagar and Jetty, Tucker Carlson, Donald Trump, um, sort of lumping them, lumping him together to some extent. I mean, you bring up the case of Hitler. I mean, some of the reforms which Hitler was enacting at the beginning actually might be stuff that certain people on the left or social democrats actually might be willing to work with him on right some of the early stuff that hitler was doing um obviously he went uh he did stuff that no one can support and no one can ever condone um but the thought is well if you work with him um work with them on certain issues you end up actually building their credibility you end up working with them um and building up their views i think nathan robinson would say something along the lines of that do you think there's any merit to that argument I, I, I can see the case. I mean, I I think in general, try to try to work with people, but but I get the argument because, you know, you look at someone like Trump, I don't see there's too many places where I would work with Trump because I think a continued Trump presidency may cost us the democracy, right? So it kind of depends what the price is for working with that person. The price of working with Hitler, very high, right? The The cost of working with Trump seems very high. It could cost us, you know, more and more of our democracy, maybe the whole democracy. So I... I guess I can kind of see the point that working with certain individuals is sort of a path to nowhere. But at the same time, where do you draw the line of how much we disagree about? Like you and I tend to agree on a lot of what we talk about. I'm sure we could find areas where you and I don't agree. So does that mean I should write you off as someone, you know, oh, I can't can't believe that he thinks that one thing. Right. Or do you do you say, well, we, we tend to be like minded. We disagree on some things. Let's let's see what we can make of our ideas together. Well, let's see. So. I, I do agree with that. Like, I definitely think that, you know, you just got to work with people like you're never going to find anyone who completely agrees with you. But I think Robinson's claim, Nathan's claim there would be, well, it depends on the degree and the kind of disagreement, right? Like there are certain sorts of disagreements that are beyond the pale. There are certain things that you can do, certain sins that you can commit that are um, unforgivable. Un, uh, unforgivable sins in politics and the claim uh, that Nathan Robinson would be making 
is that certain views when it comes to immigration are beyond the pale. Um, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I mean, I think that, you know, I disagree and I'll fight you tooth and nail to it, but it's, um, th there seems to be, you know, if you can work with someone, you probably should work with them as long as you know that you're not being tricked. I don't know. That's my opinion. Um, uh, but anyway, so let's talk a little bit about populism then, because I guess the debate is, well, what is sort of right wing populism, right? I mean, that seems to be what we're sort of pushing in on. Um, populism, as defined by the dictionary, is something to do along with the lines of a political approach, which is like striving to fight against the elites, right? So I guess I guess where I get stuck on, though, is how is there a difference between right wing and left wing populism? Or I should say, where is the agreement between right wing and left wing populism? Because it seems like the agreement or disagreement is who is defined as the elites, right? Like if populism is about fighting the elites, it would seem that the difference between right wing and left wing populism is who the elites are. And then you would start to wonder, well, is there any place for agreement? Like is populism even a useful term? I don't know. What do you, what do you think about that? I don't know. It seems to me like it it's hard to judge populism on the left and the right because they kind of seem to me like totally different animals. I mean, I, I can't even quite wrap my brain around what right wing populism is. I mean, Trump's Trump was ushered in on, you know, they say he was ushered in on a wave of right wing populism. And it's like, well, but what exactly is that? Like, what was the wave that brought him in? People just seem to have, it, it doesn't seem like there's much in the way of a concept there. It was just, Oh, we don't like government. This guy, this guy's not a, not a, politician, so he's going to do it differently. I mean, there didn't seem to be a whole lot underlying there besides trying to get an extra Supreme Court pick. Um, well, there was, that, a, you know, I mean, for certain in. people, I mean, I, w I don't know. I would say, though, there was like a strong American sentiment that like a lot of elites, a lot of politicians had sold out. I mean, you'll remember before Donald Trump came in, there was this big rhetoric around the rhino, right? The Republican in name only, you know, and, and, and basically everyone in Republican leadership were, were rhinos, basically, because they sold out. They weren't doing the truly American thing. And when Donald Trump came in, there was this mood among a lot of people that Donald Trump represented the true America, right? There's this kind of deep nationalism there. And so the elites were betraying America in a certain sense. They were, you know, putting themselves before others. And so there is a kind of connection, at least there, when it comes to how how people are thinking about the world between you know, between the left and the right. But there is an interesting sort of divide, I'd say, like, in sort of economic social thought, I don't really know how to put it, between those who would argue that, you know, the the ails of current society were caused by um, elites leaving the people or people leaving the elites, right? So when it comes to the people leaving the elites, these are the kinds of criticisms of the social criticisms, right? So people became entrenched with racism, they became bigots. And so they began to, you know, leave the working class, right? The racist work, you know, they didn't want to align with um, issues of race. And then there's also another argument that says, well, it was actually the elites leaving the people where, you know, this, this argument goes something along the lines of trade deals and how, you know, they were more, they were selling out to large corporations, selling out overseas. And so they were shipping jobs overseas. And as a result, unions, unions weakened, right? I mean, these are two different narratives. And in many respects, yeah. they're telling diametrically opposed, um, opposed views. So I don't know, how does that feed into this idea of left, right populism? Well, and part of it, it kind of depends, who, like, who do you mean when you mean the elites, right? Are we talking about right. the elite politicians who are actually calling the shots? Are we talking about the billionaire puppet masters behind the scenes who are actually calling the shots? Like, is it is it companies? Like, who who is actually the elites? And I think that's that's maybe part of the issue is, is people have a different idea of what the what elites are. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, I think that like right wing, po like this is where I get confused, Chris. So I, I genuinely like maybe we can try to think through this because when I try to think about who the right sees as the elites, I, I genuinely get confused because on the left, it's actually relatively clear. It's it's corporations, co you know, left wing populism is actually pretty clear cut. It's you know, it's it's that latter view that I was describing where, you know, the trade deals and, you know, people selling out to capitalism, corporations are the bad guys, they're undermining America, they're under, you know, I mean, it's pretty clear cut. But then when I try yeah. to think about right wing populism, I, I genuinely get confused because I'm like, who do they see as the elites? To some extent, it's government. But then to some extent, it's not right. So for instance, they'll talk about 
um, term limits is a big one on the right because you know you, you know you go to Washington and you get corrupted, right? You you uh, you know you lose yourself in a certain way. Um, it, you might have you might have had good intentions, but then Washington corrupt you, corrupted you. But I'm trying to figure out like what is the corrupting thing? Is it literally just government? Is it literally just government? In which case, in which case, the whole thing in which you know right wing populists such as Sagar criticize the idea that government can't do anything seems to like collapse so that so it's like that can't be right that can't be what's going on yeah um i don't know i genuinely get confused here yeah i think i think we could have a government that does work we just have people in charge who don't want to make it work right they're they're being rewarded by the the system that currently works and so there's no you know at least for many of them there isn't a motivation to fix voting rights there isn't a vote a uh, motivation to get money out of politics which is you know you can't have much of a government if you if you literally have people buying laws and, and well, buying well, sure. favors. Well, sure, but who who are the like you were saying? Like, who does the right see as the elites? Is there is there an answer to that question? Like, in other words, is right wing populism like a thing? Like, is it actually a thing? I right. mean, that's that's sort of what you were bringing up at the beginning. And like I, like I said, like it seems like it's a thing. Like it seems like it's a new like. Here's 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 where I'll here's here's where I'll put my cards on the table, and this might get me in trouble with some of you guys watching here. I wonder whether or not what we see when we talk about right-wing populism is a, an actual form of populism or it's just a kind of new right. And when I say new right, I don't just mean like alt-right. Like I don't mean that to mean automatically bad, all right? I'm not saying that, right? But I, I just sometimes wonder if it's just like a new formulation of, of, of the right that's a backlash to the libertarianism of, of old days, right? Where, you know, people are like, well, actually we can do government sometimes. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like when I sometimes if I'm listening to, you know, a, a media piece, they'll talk about, you know, the elite liberals and the coastal elites and stuff like that. But when I talk to real people, like re real human beings that I know, it's usually not about the, the Republicans are not usually too concerned about elites. They're just concerned about being the opposition to the liberals. Right. That kind of seems mm. to be. The focal point, and that's kind of what it seems like this election's going to be about. I mean, Biden is about being not Trump, and Trump is essentially about being not not liberal, right? Not one of these liberals. Yeah. And it seems to me like that's that's a lot of what people are going to vote based on because things are so spread apart now that if you're in the mm. middle, I mean, on the left, if someone's in the middle, you you know, like Biden, you're like, well, that's practically a Republican. And then on the other side, if you're anywhere near the middle, it's like you were saying earlier, you get called the rhino. You know, it just seems like everything's so polarized that it's really about disliking the other side. So do you think that there's a direct connection then between political polarization and populism? I, I think that one, it's it's entirely possible that the uh, the polarization could follow, right? It could be the, the result or at least a partial result mm -hmm. of, you know, people people just getting sick of the government not working for them. Right. It's like you it's so easy to look around and go, what is the government doing for me right now? What is the government done in the last two years? What is the government done in the last 20 years for me specifically? And some people can say, well, yeah, what was it, six or eight years ago? I got health care because of the government and stuff like that. But that list is surprisingly short about what the government is actually doing for the people anymore. And I think that gives the and that's like the best case scenario. Right. right. My question is, what is the government done for me? And we have the streets filled with people who are saying, I'll show you what the government's done for me. They've, you know, beat up a family member. They've harassed me when I'm trying to go to the to to the store right. and this other stuff. So it, it makes sense. There's a there's a building and anger. Then, right. But then but then well, of course, where the confusion sets in is then the same people who are like, you know, right wing populist who are like, you know, anti government are also the same people who are pro government when it comes to you know, when it comes to the police. Now, I will say when it comes to the issue of populism and um, polarization is it does seem that like people are very confused and I'll include myself in this when it comes to what needs to be explained when we try to explain polarization. You know, you read just about any literature on uh, polarization. It seems like there's a conflation between sort of public polarization, you know, the sentiments of everyday people and the polarization when it comes to, you know, for instance, how likely legislation is to pass. So, you know, you read political science literature, they'll try to explain 
po public polarization, you know, polarization in terms of ideas by trying to explain, you know, what or, or talking about, for instance, um, the fact that fewer bills are getting passed or that fewer legislators are working with one another as though there were a direct correlation. I don't know. I get sort of flashbacks to, you know, Francis Bacon, the, you know, old time, uh, old time scientist philosopher who, when he was trying to explain heat, his treatise on heat, he was also trying to, exp he said that any explanation of heat also needed to explain the, you know, sort of waves that come off of cow dung when it goes down, right? So it seems like, you know, we might be trying to lump in things um, to one explanation, which, you know, might not be in the same explanation. I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, I, I suppose that tangent, right? Like we'd probably need to spend a couple decades researching, <laughs> you right, know, researching right. it here. We're not going to solve it in a, you know, 20 minute conversation or what have you. But I guess I want to push a little bit then on this distinction between social and economic policies or uh, yeah, policies, because it seems to me like that's one of the major major things that a lot of people talk about, whether it's Kyle Kalinske when he made the video about it, or whether or not it's Crystal Ball, or whether or not it's Sagar and Jetty trying to explain his own views, he'll say, people will say, well, Sagar is economically left and socially liberal, um, or <laughs> economically left and socially conservative. And that seems nice. That seems like a very easy way to sort things. You know, you have your political compass. I, that's a terrible cross right there. You know, you have your political compass out there. You know, you have your economic axis and you have your social axis. But is it really the case that there's a meaningful distinction between social and economic issues? So, for instance, you know, you think about the issue of immigration. Is that a social issue or is that an economic issue? Well, it's not clear to me because it seems that the, right. the debate there is on who is or who is not allowed to be as a member, a legitimate tax-paying member of a particular economy. So it's not clear to me that it's a social issue. It seems that, it, well, well, it's an right. economic issue, and then people try to make it into an aspect of social, or they try to make social issues into an aspect of economic issues, especially when you, I, I want to make another point here, which is that in many respects, what's an economy? An economy is a way of trying to assign value, trying to assign measurements of other people. You know, we look at people who are rich and we think that, oh, well, they're high status, right? There's a deep connection there between social and economic issues. And this kind of liberal attempt to apartheid, the distinction between social and economic issues might be deeply mistaken because a lot of people, you know, um, and I think it's quite unfortunate, but a lot of people try to find meeting based on their economic, um, you know, yeah. their economic issues. So I don't know. I don't know that there is this kind of neat and clear distinction which can be made. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's it's hard to unravel because most of the time there is both a social and an economic uh, aspect to almost everything. I mean, you can find some aspects like uh, gay marriage, like, uh, you know, when gay marriage was passing, it's probably not going to affect me economically, whether gay people are allowed to get married or not, right? That's well, that's I don't know. I mean, you, I mean, well, well, actually, let me let me push you back. Uh, let me push on you a little bit there. Because you know, when it comes to gay marriage as well, I mean, much of the debate was revolving around the economic benefits that came from marriage. I mean, and, 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 and it's not clear that all of those benefits were entirely legal. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it, but it, yeah, I guess there, I mean there are there's always some amount of money. I mean, it's hard to find anything that doesn't involve money in in one way or another, right? That it has tied into it. But if if two people are allowed to marry and they get a tax break or something, it's probably not going to affect me well, directly, right? Well, it's well, well. Hey, look, you know, for instance, with the inheritance tax, one of the things that Frank Luntz did to try to split Democrats on the inheritance tax, how he actually did the thing was by calling up LGBT uh, groups and, and communities and convincing them that they should be against the inheritance tax because gay people didn't benefit from basically like gay people were like because they couldn't marry they were excluded from it and so it ended up dividing and splitting up the the democratic coalition and that's how republicans were able to get through so many of those tax cut proposals because they would you know target LGBT groups and convince them that they should oppose some particular tax reform right and so suddenly democratic representatives are getting called yeah. from calls from their lgbt you know constituents saying look i need you to oppose the inheritance tax when of course the issue was never the inheritance tax the issue was the deep and immoral injustice of having right. gay marriage be illegal right i guess to me i i see even in that i mean yeah if laws are being changed that's obviously a problem but the you know people's personal finances that they get to engage or not get engaged in based on marriage law it seems like those things can be changed but the the economic impact is on a much smaller scale than say medicare for all 
right? You can't even get anywhere near a conversation about Medicare for all without, okay, that's going to cost obviously massive amounts of money, it, it, at least, you know, uh, in the reorganization of things, right? It's going to well, be I mean, disruptive even, to economies yeah. and stuff like that. So there it's like, you, you cannot really separate the social from the economic. Whereas I feel like with the, with a subject like gay marriage, it's like the social aspect is so overwhelmingly larger than the economic Im impact. That, but even there, uh, as as we're seeing in this discussion, right. they can still be very hard to separate. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I, I guess that that's sort of the thing that I just wanted to push on a little bit when it comes to this distinction, because it seems like the given distinction. I mean, again, Kyle Kalinske in his video talking about it, he literally just says, "Well, isn't populism just a kind of economic philosophy?" And like to some extent, like I agree. Like it, it seems like that's like the easy way to think about it, and it might work. You know, eighty. 80% of the time, 85% of the time. But then when you really start pushing on the distinction, it's not clear that there is a distinction. You know, we hear, for instance, debates about how much people should be should be paid, right? Is that an economic issue or is that a social issue when it comes to how people should be valued or, or, or the status of people? You know, one of the big criticisms of the economy just is the fact that many low paid workers are some of the most important contributors to society, right? I mean, Andrew Yang, for instance, yeah, belt right. up his criticism of, or, or I should essential say, belt workers, up, right? Right. It, it, the idea of essential workers or the idea of, well, hold on people like, for instance, I mean, Andrew Yang talked about how he had a special need, how he has a special needs son and that his wife is at home producing much more economic value, taking care of, you know, taking care of the family as opposed to he was just running around talking about president. That's the thing that Andrew Yang said. And um, there is a lot of truth to that, right? So I don't know that you can disentangle economic and social issues um, in any neat or clear way. And I almost sometimes feel like, you know, the, the, the attempt to say, oh, well, I'm with you on economic issues, but then I'm not with you on social issues can sometimes just be cynically used. Oftentimes mm -hmm. not, but sometimes, right? Sometimes, right? To be like, guys, like, you know, nuance here, oftentimes not, but sometimes can just be used cynically to say, okay, well, this is a social issue. That is a social issue. That is a social issue. When honestly, none of them are, and also none of them are not. Um, so I don't, I don't like, I literally do not know. I'm just, I guess, like raising a question when we try to understand what right-wing populism is. Because again, the question of right-wing populism is, does it boil down to Hitler, right? <laughs> because if it boils down to Hitler, Nathan Robinson is right is right when it comes to his article. But if it doesn't boil down to Hitler, then he's wrong, right? So I don't know. I'm just trying to sort of think through this a little bit. And a, a lot of issues seem to boil down to money in this country, right? You'll talk to people and then, you know, even if they're kind of wondering, the bottom line us usually ends up being the what's it going to cost? What, what are the economics of this issue? And I would even, you know, people like to call this a, a Christian nation. I would almost argue that the, the religion of this country is capitalism, right? If something makes a profit, then it's, then it's worth doing. If something doesn't make a profit, then you shouldn't do it. That's the decision that we seem to make in this country is that our values are based on, is it profitable? And we have companies that, you know, hedge funds and stuff that, you know, they basically break down companies that are employing thousands of people and, you know, so they can make some short term money. And this is seen as a great thing. This is seen as valuable. And this, yeah. this is great. This look at these look at these people out there working hard, making all of this money. In the meantime, there's there's people left in the, you know, a wake of people, jobless people left behind them. And and but we but we consider that ethical. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, again, though, like so many of the question of how much someone should get paid is in many respects a status issue. So how is it not then a social right. issue, right? So I don't know. I just don't right. know that you can really disentangle them so clearly or so neatly. But anyway, I want to go back a little bit to that idea of sort of battle of ideas, right? It seems like we've been, you know, there might be some prerequisites to having a clear and fleshed out battle of ideas anyway, right? Um, you know, you, you think about education, you think about um, certain kinds of healthcare, maybe even, right? Um, what do you think? Like, cause, cause if, if the idea is, well, we value the battle, the battle of ideas and that's why rising is a good thing, then it seems like we need to talk about the prerequisites to having a healthy battle of ideas in this country. Yeah, exactly. You, you want to have this battle of ideas, but then you kind of need the people who are sitting at the table, listening to this idea, these ideas to be one open-minded about listening to other ideas and then sort of have the capability of critically thinking through 
through a conversation without, you know, necessarily getting emotional or, you know, that having those those critical thinking skills. And as someone who, you know, works in education, those those skills are being watered down as we water down our education, as we let education sort of atrophy. Right. We, we have less and less people who are learning those critical thinking mm. skills who are and, and you might even think you do because you can you've learned to argue that own point of view. But if you're never really considering someone else's point of view, if it's never really put on there, you know, it's like that argument they make. What what could it take you to change your mind in this conversation? And if you enter a conversation saying there's nothing that could change my mind, then you're not really having a, a, a true intellectual conversation. Right. You have to be willing to hear someone out and say, no, I reject your idea, but here's the reason and have it be, you know, legitimate and valid reason. And that's that's a skill that many people just don't have these days. Yeah, I mean, I hear that. I hear that. I also wonder, though, I mean, you, you mentioned there the idea of emotions. What is the role of emotion in reason? I mean, you know, you say, for instance, that like emotion can cloud judgment. And certainly sometimes, right, like we all we've all had those incidents where, you know, we get really emotional and then we kind of lose ourselves a little bit. We're not thinking particularly clearly. Um, but oftentimes when we talk about political arguments, we are talking about something which is grounded in emotion and grounded in how something is or is not going to make us feel or how we think something is or is not going to make us feel. And so in some sense, it seems like emotion is incredibly valuable and incredibly important for politics. Um, so is the role of sharpening critical thinking um, to help us understand the things which will make us feel good, help us understand our own emotions better? Or is it the ability to argue our point better and win something? You know, I, I was on the debate team for, for a couple of years, um, did quite well on the debate team. Um, but did I actually learn anything about, you know, like understanding my own views? Honestly, I'm not I'm not actually convinced that um that it was I mean, I think it was really fruitful for me in, in, in other ways, but when I actually think back, you know, I, I sometimes wonder how fruitful it really was, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And emotions definitely have a place. I mean, can you really have a genuine conversation with someone if you don't have the capability to have empathy for what that person is saying or or the place that they're coming from? You, you know, you have to have some empathy. You have to have some understanding. But I think the the problem where where I'm calling it more out is when the emotion becomes so strong that it actually impedes the conversation from happening. You know, like you'll see, you know, Hannity and these other people uh, immediately just start shouting over someone else because they're, you know, so loud and, and excited about something that you're you're not even really allowing mm -hmm. the true conversation to take place. And I think they're in that case, you don't really have that exchange of ideas and emotions are fine. I mean, we see people people in the streets full of emotion right now. I think that's great that they're getting out there and expressing those emotions. And when you listen to them, it's clear that they've or many of the people, it's clear they've thought about those ideas, they've had conversations about those ideas, um, and then they're out there ex very, very emotion and expressive about it, and I think that's fine. So then let me ask you this, then. Is it really about critical thinking skills, or is it about judgment? The ability to discern more accurately and more aptly where or where not some emotion is justified. I mean, there's definitely a gray area there, and it's, you know, there's no, like, we can draw the line that says this is exactly where emotions are helpful and where they're not. I guess when I talk about critical thinking, part of it is about being able to question your previously held beliefs, right? Be, you know, like I grew yeah. up with a different belief system than I have now as far as politics. And at some point I was willing yeah. to let those be challenged. I was willing to let that change. And I think we, we should all do that. You should be willing to, you know, look at your own team and call out people on your, you know, quote unquote team, your political team, call them out and then listen to those ideas. And you might not even like some of the ideas that are coming from your own, you know, what your own side of the aisle, whatever that happens to be. You, you have to be willing to look at these in a in a way and really act like. You want to be consistent with yourself, at least, at least self-consistent, right? Do do all my own ideas even fit together or do some of them oppose each other? And you, you can't get to that kind of place if you don't have some level of critical thinking. So I want to ask you then, um, or maybe we can think about a little bit when it comes to the other things, because we've talked about education, but then there's also this concern about technology, right? That like, uh, right. you know, we we love entertainment, right? We want our news to entertain us. We want everything to, you know, be flashy, be exciting. Um, you don't want to listen to a long, drawn out conversation like this one. You know, you want explosions and animated graphics going on. Right. Um, 
do you think that technology undermines our ability to have a fruitful, meaningful, democratic discourse? I think that it absolutely is a speed bump bet between most people and getting to that, you know, what we're what I'm loosely calling critical thinking here, because you never hear that other point of view. When you go on Facebook, they're going to feed you the stuff that they think you want to sit there and read. And you go on YouTube. YouTube is feeding, feeding you the videos that it thinks that you want to watch. And you're not so much getting that oppo opposing point of view. And even even in that case, it seems like, um, you know, we were talking about emotion a little while ago. It's like I see so many people on YouTube that are quote unquote political people. And yet it's really just about shouting over other people and making big dramatic moments. So there's the drama and the, oh, this person got owned and, you know, this person got dunked on over mm -hmm. here and that kind of stuff. And it's it's so hard to get to any kind of actual conversation where people are willing to, you know, it's almost like it requires a little bit of a vulnerability where you put your idea out there, the other person puts their idea out there, and then you do the hard work of thinking about, well, what do these two ideas mean, right? And that that's really the hard part. Throwing out an idea and me just yelling at you and saying, oh, I dunked on him, like, you know, what what has really been accomplished there? That's that's not that hard to do. It's the, the hard work is trying to come to some kind of, of you know, meaningful underpinning of, of concepts and understanding. I guess we'll close out on on uh, on this. I want to ask you, though, you know, you were saying that there's an issue with dunking or with bringing stuff on. That's obviously relevant to both of us, being that we have uh, have YouTube channels or whatever. Um, you know, sometimes I think back, though, you know, Plato's Republic opens or I shouldn't say opens, but one of the first lines opens up with this idea of Socrates going down into the form or going down into the public square. And it seems very deliberate because in the same way, you know, the famous, you know, allegory of the cave also, right. you know, the guy goes back down into the cave and descends into the cave and discourses on the, you know, shadows and the like. It seems that there's this model of Socrates that he went down into the forum. He went down to debate the public things that uh, people were concerning themselves with. And Plato really admired Socrates for for that because he was debating about these things that concerned everyday people, but that he was then able to redirect them to the truth. Now you can disagree with Platonic or Socrates, you know, philosophy or the like, but there might be something to that. Is there anything of value which can be had to dunking? I guess is what I want to sharpen the question to you with. I mean, I I think it's I think it's very entertaining. And I think it's it serves to be good entertainment. But I, I guess that's kind of the what I go through when I'm watching those videos, which is I, I feel like the meaning has kind of been drained out once they're dunking on someone. And it's Can just you... sort of like like entertainment. At that OK, point. so let me let me redirect my question then. So is it possible to start with a dunk or use a dunk to then you know, sort of segue into something that might be more meaningful? Yeah. And I guess it depends what, you know, the we could rigorously define dunking to exactly what that means. I mean, if you're if you're dunking on someone in a way where you're sort of your ideas are, you know, have pretty much shown the the light of day of the faults of the other person's ideas, then at least there you're getting that intellectual idea part of things. If you're just dunking on someone by yelling at them or or bringing up some other related issue, which isn't really about like what's being talked about, then you haven't really progressed the discussion. So I guess if you dunk on someone in a way where you've actually progressed the intellectual discourse, which which can be done, right, then I then yeah, it can definitely serve serve a purpose. It can serve a purpose. Well, I hope that we've done that today. Started off with a weird discussion about Nathan Robinson dunking on Crystal Ball and Sagar and Jetty and hopefully trying to talk a little bit about populism and all that stuff. So maybe we've modeled it, maybe we haven't, maybe we've completely failed. But regardless, make sure you guys go over and check out Chris's channel. It's Political Perspective. He's got some great stuff over there. And I'll tell you what, guys, his thumbnails recently, his thumbnails recently they've been incredible they've been fantastic so go over there check out his thumbnails and then check out some videos while you're over there too so we'll see you all in the next one thanks for watching